Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Wolf Meta Musings and another Age of Sigmar Warcry video. Today, we're going to be doing more army list building. You guys voted for this. You wanted to see Seraphon and Splintered Fang up next. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And yeah, so let's, let's get going. Okay, so talking about Splintered Fang themselves, they're one of the original 1.0 Warcry warbands that were released during that version. Personally, I think they took a very big hit on the move from Warcry 1 to 2nd edition, simply because their whole gimmick and their whole shtick for snakes themselves, they are very fragile. And with the points rebalancing, they lost a bunch of defensive stats and they gained a bunch of points. They're now 90 points apiece. So you're not able to swarm the board with your snakes anymore. And because of that, the Serpent Caller, which is the fighter that I've got here, the guy with the snakes around him, he lost a lot more value. Because the Serpent Caller's whole ability is that he can force the snakes to make an additional attack action. But if you're no longer allowed to bring a lot of snakes, and why would you? They are very fragile. And their damage, especially with the prevalence of counter in the game nowadays, has really taken a hit. So that's really reduced the stock of the Serpent Caller himself. Talking about the chaff a little bit, Splintered Fang chaff is okay. They're in that strange kind of middle ground for chaff units where they're not cheap enough for you to really just swarm the board with a whole bunch of rubbish fighters, but they're not expensive enough where they would get the offensive stats to go with that. So they do have 10 wounds, which is nice, but they've got very average offensive and defensive profiles. So yeah, they're probably some of the weakest fighters in the warband, and they really won't be achieving all that much outside maybe going, getting objectives, and just providing more models and more activations for you to use for your other fighters. The Splintered Fang themselves have nothing amazing on the damage front. Again, very average damage across the board. Even on their leader, they're looking at okay damage for a leader model. That being said, they do have a lot of three inch range. They do have a lot of whips. And the idea is that using those whips, they'll be able to do damage from three inches and try and push up their survivability that way whilst not being able to be attacked back. Talking about their leader, the True Blood, it does have the best net in the game, so that automatically makes it a very viable leader model in itself. I think overall, when you look at the Warband, what it's really crying out for is a big damaging piece that can kind of stu get stuck in there and tie up a lot of your opponent's time, whilst your three inch range whips can do the work and attack from range without getting attacked back. I think that's really what it's looking for, is it will be very difficult to ally in better chaff units so going the entire opposite end of the spectrum and going for something really big, really bulky might be the best way to go with them if you're doing your list building. Okay, so going to fighters of interest here, I've talked a little bit about the True Blood already. 170 points is not amazingly expensive for one of the bespoke heroes, but it's not exactly super cheap either. And he's got a 4425 damage profile, which is okay. Really, he wants something like strength five. I think that strength four of his is his biggest barrier to doing real damage onto the different kinds of fighters that you would want him to do damage to, because most of his targets are going to be toughness four or toughness five anyway. Similarly, with that base damage of two, it kind of there are a lot of two four damage profile fighters, especially in the bespoke warbands. So having a leader with a base damage of two isn't really in anything amazing. That being said, he does have the best net in the game, effectively. It's a double, it's a point and click, so you pick an enemy fighter within three inches, and that fighter doesn't get to move or disengage. So there's no messing around with rolling dice, no messing around with dice values. He's very reliable. You look at a thing and effectively it will be netted as long as you have that double. This makes him one of the better ally options out of the bespoke warbands. If you really needed a net and you wanted to bring it in, Chaos aren't like Destruction where they have a bunch of net allies that they can call upon. So yeah, the True Blood is, in terms of a utility fighter that can also do a little bit of damage, I think is pretty good. Then I wanted to show off the Venom Bloods. I think the Venom Blood with Barbed Whip is the best one out of the builds. We're going to talk about Venom Bloods in a little bit. But for 105 points, what do you get? You get good toughness. You get a decent amount of wounds. 10 wounds isn't amazing, but for around about 100, 105, maybe 110 points, 10 wounds is perfectly serviceable, especially with that toughness five, which is stretching out 
how long he can stay on the battlefield for. He does have the whip, so he's got three inch range. Four attacks, a strength four. Always very welcome, especially on a fighter of this points cost. One four damage profile is okay. I'd like him to have a two four damage profile, but I mean, you can't really have everything. And on top of that, because he's got the shield, he's got a fanged bucklet double, which I really like. It's effectively three damage on a three plus which I feel is very good in the event where your Venom Blood has to do a move attack action and you find yourself within one inch. I know his whips have a three inch range, but you know, sometimes you do find yourself closer. Just doing the Fang Buckler double will net you more damage than an extra attack most of the time. And it does always wound on threes. So regardless of what you're fighting, it could be toughness five, it could be toughness 10, whatever it is, it will always do that three damage on a three plus, which I find very valuable during my games. Finally, here we have the snakes i was talking about how they took a big hit going into this edition they only have toughness two they only have six wounds which is a big problem for them then 90 points which is quite expensive the reason for that 90 points of course it will be their movement six they do have five attacks which is nice but it's only strength three so you're very susceptible to being countered and even if you miss with only a couple of your attacks you're going to be taking a lot of damage back and it's very likely that you'll basically die from it so i wouldn't really recommend the snakes this time around something i do want to talk about is their reaction vicious repost this is kind of a nice alternative to counter effectively you use vicious repost when your opponent attacks you and any miss rolls of one or two will turn into automatic two damage back to your opponent I have done an article in the past about reaction control and Vicious Repost was one of those reactions that came up that if you build your warband in a certain way, you should be able to take advantage of. So that's something that we're going to be looking at when it comes to the list building. The Splintered Fang have access to a bunch of different mid-range fighter options. We've got the Serpent Caller for 145, we've got the Pure Blood for 115, and then we have the Venom Blood with four different weapon loadouts. I think of all of them, the ones that you are wanting to bring are going to be your Venom Bloods. I think your Serpent Caller, whilst it is fine, it's got a 4424 damage profile, it's got those 15 wounds, which is quite nice. I don't think the points that you're paying for it are stretching as far as they would have used to. Really what you're paying for is its ability to make your snakes attack again and get them a free attack action. But the problem is if you're not bringing snakes, there's no real reason to bring your Serpent Caller. And especially when we compare it just in a raw damage sense to the pure blood, it's got exactly the same melee profile at a 30 point discount. You're losing a few wounds, but that's not really going to be super important. I think going from 12 to 15 wounds doesn't represent enough of a jump in survivability that you're going to want to take that for the 30 points extra that you're spending. But Pure Blood does have an ability, Relentless Killers. So if it kills a guy, it gets to make an extra move or attack action. A lot of fighters have this and pretty much most of the time you're going to be wanting to put your dice into Onslaught to get those that extra damage off to kill the guy in the first place. So it's not really that high an impact that it's something that you would want to build around or take the Pure Bloods specifically for. So effectively what we're doing then is we're going to be comparing the Pure Bloods to our Venom Bloods. I've already talked about the Venom Blood with Barb Whip and the Shield. I think for 10 points cheaper, the loss of one basic damage, you can kind of work around that. You lose two wounds, but overall, because you're going to be wanting to get those extra guys into your Serpent's Fang Warbands, I'd probably always go with the whip anyway. That three inch range in the Toughness 5, it really represents a huge survivability boost over your pure blood that just those two wounds just don't cover. On top of that, it is worth noting that your Venom Bloods are going to be movement five versus the movement four of your pure bloods. So yeah, I would basically be looking into your Venom Bloods if you were going to build a strategy specifically around your medium range fighters. Here I've got a couple of lists that I put together. The first one is, like I was just saying, actually, I mean, it's really revolving around that three inch range of your Venom Bloods to do damage at a very safe range. We've got the True Blood in there, which is your hero that you want. We've got the Great Great Shaman with its Devolve ability, and Devolve will be able to pull enemy fighters into range of your whips, whilst at the same time keeping those enemy fighters out of range to counterattack you, which could be very useful in something like this. I've put in the Dark Oath War Queen. The whips themselves already get four attacks, which is very good, but the War Queen, if it's in range of those whips, they go up to five attacks, then they can onslaught for six attacks, and suddenly you're doing a lot of damage 
at a range where you wouldn't normally be able to be attacked back. The idea is with this warband, most things are going to be hitting at three inch range. The true blood hits at two inch range, but your venom bloods will be at three. So you can really keep out of the way of opponents' attacks. You use the Dark Oath War Queen to buff the rest of your fighters, and you try and spend as much of the game as possible out of range to really extend how long your fighters are going to be on the battlefield. The second list I've got here is Reaction Control. This is an extension of the list that I talked about in my previous video, and I'll put the link down in the description below for you guys to check that out. Essentially, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using as much of either counter or Vicious Repost as possible. That's why we have a ton of Clear Bloods with Shields in here. Again, we're going to be going Venom Bloods with Whips. Your 105 point Venom Bloods, they all have Toughness 5, which is very good. True Blood has Toughness 4, which is kind of okay, but he's got range 2, so he can use that 2 inch range to keep out of trouble. All your fighters, they all have the Bladed Buckler double, so they can use that to put some extra damage on if they're using their actions, mainly to use Vicious Repost or Counter. It's a very large Warband. You you need that if you're going to be playing any kind of reaction control warband because you really need to force your opponents to waste their actions trying to kill your chaff and then you can go in there with the venom bloods and do damage after that. So that's something I think might be interesting. It's not going to be for all battle packs. I think this is something that would do pretty well on the rumble pack but you might struggle in regular games with a real lack of hard hitting damaging pieces. Talking about your hard hitting damaging pieces, despite me playing around with the whips and with the reactions and all that kind of thing, that is really what Serpent's Fang need is a very hard, very fast ally that they can use and they can rely on it to do a lot of damage. So really what we're thinking about here is either the Varengard, Fomori Crusher, or if you wanted to keep up with the range idea, you can take a Centaurian Marshal. Any of these fighters would be ideal. I would be leaning more towards the Marshal or the Varengard, simply because they do have that movement 10 that you can use to get places and pressure your opponents whilst the rest of your warband gets in range, maybe with their whips or to go and get objectives. Moving forward on to Sylvaneth. Overall, they have a very versatile roster. They have a lot of different and very useful abilities on their chaff units. Some people have compared them to Gloom Spike Gits in that every single one of their basic guys have an ability that would be useful at different points in the game. So they really represent a nice list building challenge as to which fighters you want to take and what abilities you want to take in terms of utility. You can lean more into nets, you can lean more into teleport, you can lean more into damage boosting. They have access to the Kurnoth Hunters, which of course gives them some very tough, very damaging units, which is always welcome. And they also have access to some very good infaction Bladeborn fighters that they can use to really push that efficiency of your guys. They did quite well very early on in Warcry 2's life. I think there was a list at Nova which came top five or top eight with Sylvaneth. It doesn't seem like anyone's managed to replicate that success, but I, I mainly put that down to people just not playing the faction all that much. If you wanted an all-round solid faction with decent fighters, I think Sylvaneth represent a pretty good, pretty good option for that. Going on into the fighters of interest, we've got your Revenants here, your Spite Revenants and your Tree Revenants, both the hero versions and the basic versions. They're going to kind of be your bread and butter of your Warband, the Spite Revenants have Shrieking Terror, which is a net on a 3 plus. It is a double, which is nice. Its range, it doesn't have a fixed range, so its range is going to be equal to the range of the double that you're using. So that's a bit of a positive and a bit of a negative. If you're rolling low doubles, then you have to get very close. But if you're rolling high doubles, say double five and double sixes, that's comfortably far enough away where you can net opposing key fighters and still keep outside of their melee attack range. So I think that's, that's very powerful and is very good from a utility standpoint. Your tree remnants are going to have your teleport. They've got the walk for spirit pass triple. Effectively, you remove them from the battlefield and then place them anywhere else on the battlefield more than five inches away from enemy fighters. Of course, you're going to be using this to go and to get remote objectives if you're playing objective games or remote treasure if you're playing treasure games. Really force your opponent to come to you and to have to fight you and just give them an extra step if they wanted to get those treasure tokens. My personal thought on this is that Tree Revenants are 
fine for 65 points. I think they're just too squishy to go over to pieces of treasure and then to be expected for them to survive for the entire game with that treasure. Remember their movement will be decreased by picking up that treasure. So as they run away and to try and get back to your fighters, opposing fast fighters will be able to catch them and that might be a problem for them. Finally, I wanted to highlight the Kernoth Hunters here. I've chosen the Kernoth Hunter with Great Sword. It represents one of the most damage efficient fighters that you can bring in the list. It's not the most damaging fighter you can bring, but for 170 points with a 4-5-2-5 damage profile, that's really good. The 28 wounds is really good. The toughness 4 is really decent. It's got a weighted average damage of 7, that's what you get for that. But once you start doing things like onslaughting for extra attacks, or maybe using some of your other pieces to get extra attacks, their damage potential can really go through the roof. And I would recommend that pretty much every Sylvaneth list at least thinks about bringing one, maybe two Kernoth Hunters, and maybe you want to bring the Huntmaster in there. It is a lot more points, but it does scale very well in terms of damage efficiency and the amount of damage that it's going to be putting out. Taking a second to talk about Bladeborn, in Faction they've got access to Scaith's Wild Hunt and Yothari's Guardians. I think Scaith's Wild Hunt, they give the most bang for your buck in terms of the different fighters that you might want to bring. You don't need to bring Scaith himself because everyone is Sylvaneth in this case, so you can just bring the best ones effectively. I think Carthane and Shiok are the two most efficient fighters in that list. Carthane specifically because he's got the might of the Kurnoth triple. He's only 80 points. But an 80 point fighter with the ability to give plus one attack to all friendly fighters within six inches, I think that's extremely valuable and it's something that you pretty much always want to bring. This goes back to the idea that what Sylvaneth are doing are bringing a bunch of cheap fighters that all have very useful abilities that you might want to use at different times during the battle. Shiok is only 70 points, we're not bringing any interesting abilities with him, but he does have a decent damage profile, he does have those 10 wounds which is nice, and he's got the movement 5 also, just like all of your other Sylvaneth. So if you just wanted a generic fighter to bring, maybe do a little bit of damage, maybe hold on to an objective, you could do much worse than Shiok when you're building your lists. Finally we've got Scathiel, Scathiel's from the Otharis Guardians, Again, 85 points, so not massively expensive, but not super cheap either. The 12 wounds is a pretty nice upgrade from the 10 wounds that you would be having normally on your basic fighters. And again, Scathiel doesn't have any interesting abilities that you might want to use, but a 4-3-2-4 damage profile is actually pretty decent for someone at that points level. Going into a list that I've written here, it... It is pure Sylvaneth, that's what we're going with. We've got the Tree Revenant Scion with Blade, we've got Carthane and we've got Shiok. Three Spite Revenants and three Kurnoth Hunters with Great Swords. I think that the three Kurnoth Hunters give a lot of sticking power and a lot of damage. Remember they've got that very large wound pool of 28. We've got Carthane in there who'll have the ability to give plus one attack to all friendly fighters within six inches. So that will further push the damage of your Kurnoth Hunters. They're going to be going from four to five attacks if they're within range of him. Plus onslaughts will be going to six attacks. So that's a lot of damage that the Kurnoth Hunters can put out. We've got the three Spite Revenants in there to make sure that each one of your deployment groups has access to nets, which I think is very important when you're playing something like this. And it's got access to the Tree Revenant Scion Teleport. Why did I bring the Tree Revenant Scion over a normal Tree Revenant? I was talking before that I didn't necessarily think that the Toughness 3 and the 10 Wounds of your basic Tree Revenant was necessarily enough for you to teleport somewhere, grab treasure, or go and grab an objective and reliably be able to survive that counterattack. I think that the 15 wounds is a lot better than the 10 wounds and that'll give you at least one more battle round on the field which gives your Kurnoth Hunters and the rest of your Warbands time to kind of get up there and support your Tree Revenant wherever it is. If you wanted to you could downgrade the Scion to a normal Tree Revenant and the points that you open up there will enable you to upgrade one of your Kurnoth Hunters to a Hunt Master. Now, the Hunt Master represents a big step up from one of your Kurnoth Hunters. It's a lot more expensive, but it does give you a lot more damage, especially when combined with Carthane and his attack boost. I don't know which is necessarily better if you want the Revenant Scion or if you want the Hunt Master. Only testing is going to tell from that. But I think it really depends on the missions and the battle pack 
that you'll be playing. Okay, that's it. That's it from me for today. Thank you very much for watching. That's really my take on both Sylvaneth and Splintered Fang. I hope that that was something that was useful for you and something that you can take forward in your games and maybe try some of those out. As always, if you like what you see, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, yeah, let me know. Let me know what you think about those lists that I put forward. If you've got any cool combos or any lists that you want to share from both Splintered Fang or from Sylvaneth, that'd be really interesting to see. If you think maybe I've missed something in my analysis of these two warbands, that would also be something nice to share with the group. Or if you think that I've gone totally crazy and the list I put forward are complete garbage, that's also something that I'm interested to hear. But yeah, that's it. That's it from me for today. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.